Hey, good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Bill with World Bible School, and welcome to Take Another Look, where we are talking about the book of Revelation, verse by verse. This is lesson one hundred, number 127 that we're doing today. So welcome, everyone. It's good to see Dr. Faye joining in, and uh, others are coming on board as we, uh, as we uh, go. And... Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started, and then I'll address your comments and things after the show. Uh, but uh, if you would, please click like and then click share so that others can watch this video also. Good to see uh, Linda Routley, one of our WBSU students, uh, Brother David Jacobs, our board member, and others who are, are watching right now. Uh, you don't have to comment in the comment section, but you can. And uh, thank you so much for being on the show this morning. Uh, as I said, uh, this is called Take Another Look, where we're talking about the book of Revelation verse by verse. And we are looking at the events surrounding the Apostle John and this vision that he has, uh, which turns out to be more than a vision, almost like a, a, a supernatural interaction with the, the realm of God. And uh, in these lessons, I'm sharing with you what I believe Holy Spirit has shared with me and what he has shown me. And so if you're joining me for the first time, then uh, as we look at the Apostle John, we're seeing uh, as he saw into this uh, new dimension, uh, not brand new in that he wasn't aware, but brand new in that he never had this kind of an encounter before that we we can see. Uh, and uh, we're seeing what we can learn from his experience. So keep in mind that I am teaching the, the book of Revelation uh, from the idea that this is the unveiling of the anointed one in us. It's a picture. It's an unveiling. It's a showing. It's a revealing of some things that we need to see. So I'm asking you to keep your heart and your mind open to hear what Holy Spirit is saying today, because the way I define Revelation is the unveiling of the Father's heart. So let's continue today as we see and hear uh, see what uh, look at what John sees next and what John hears next as he shows us how to operate from the heavenly realm of our origin while we're ministering here in this earthly realm. We're looking today at John chapter um, 16 verse um, uh, John 16 verse 10 and verse 11. And so let's look at these verses and then we'll try to uh, break them down so that in an understandable fashion or at least from the perspective I'm seeing this from. Uh, so here's what it says. Then the fifth angel, or we know that this is the Greek word angelos, which means messenger. And messengers are those who are in the spirit realm, the realm that we can see, we can interact with, but we don't necessarily see with our natural eyes or uh, perceive them with a natural mind that is unrenewed. So that's why I'm teaching this stuff, so that we can walk in a renewed mind. Uh, the fifth angel or the fifth messenger poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. Now, we've seen a lot of places, per, so to speak, that these first four bowls have been poured on or poured onto or revealed to different things, but now on the throne of the beast and his kingdom became full of darkness. So this word became uh, tells us that this is a past tense scenario. Uh, we also know that from Revelation 1 verse 1 or from Revelation 1, those first few verses, that this is a symbolic language that we're looking at here, which describes the book of Revelation. Uh, so the, his kingdom became full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. The blasphemy of God, they blasphemed God, the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of all of their deeds or of their deeds. So we have seen the, the bowls of wrath being poured out in other places so far. But remember uh, that verse one had told us of chapter 16, uh, with a, I said with a loud voice from the temple uh, saying to the seven messengers, go and pour out the seven bowls of wrath of God on the earth. Now we know that earth is symbolic uh, a symbolic language in the Bible that earth, even when you read that the, the heavens and the earth 
uh, were uh, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, which a Greek um, uh, kind of a um, uh, not a euphemism, but but kind of in their uh, interpretive way, they would say one thing, but it would mean something else. Well, in that case, it means universe. So God created the heavens and the earth being the universe. Then it says that the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. I personally believe that we're looking at literally we were birthed out of God and then immediately from verse one to uh, verse two to verse three, God said, let there be light and illumination took place in our soul. I mean, God created us, bam, 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 uh, created us, gave us illumination, gave us a body, gave us a soul. I mean, it all all happened in a very short amount of time, uh, probably even in moments, even though Revelation chapter one or Genesis chapter one, two and three kind of lay it out uh, a little in a little bit lengthier uh, explanation. And so as we look at this, we need to keep in mind that the word for wrath comes from the Greek word uh, thumos, thumos, uh, which refers to the fierceness and indignation of God's passion toward his creation. And as the Greek said, as it's as if he were breathing hard toward you in uh, as in being passionate about you. And yet Revelation 15, one told us that these bowls being poured out uh, referred to the, the seven last plagues of which the word plague comes from the Greek word plague, meaning a stroke or a wound coming directly from out of the temple of God, which is you. You are the temple of God, or you're the place where God lives, or let's say it this way, the place that you're connected with him is in you, all of you, every part of you. And symbolically, through these last seven plagues, the Holy Spirit was working, and we're not talking about necessarily in us today, but in the first century, this is being explained in this vision that John has, how that uh, the Holy Spirit is working uh, and at removing everything in us that remains tied to an earthly, the earthliness of carnal thinking in man's soul. In other words, everything that's tied to an earthly awareness or a carnal awareness. But notice the place where the fifth bowl is poured out, which is on the throne of the beast. Revelation 16, 10 uh, in the King James said, the fifth angel poured out his vial up on the seat of the beast and the and his kingdom was full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues for pain now when we look at this we see that the new king james says upon the the uh, uh upon the uh throne whereas the king james says upon the seat okay so it's the same thing but just as a point of explanation we want to see what he's trying to tell us here because it's important that we understand uh, why this is um, significant in this lesson today. Now, notice this. Um, uh, the, the word for seat as used here is symbolic of authority or of the rule of one who is in authority. While the word for seat is translated as throne in other places, the emphasis remains the same. So here's the thing. The word throne in the book of Revelation is symbolic of dominion. Now, where do you see dominion at the first time? That's right, in Genesis chapter one, God gave man dominion over all the creation of his hands, the, the bird, birds of the air, the fowl of the air, the, the beast of the field, uh, and so on. And so we have been given dominion. And here we look at the place that this beastly nature or this beastly mindset is ruling in authority. And God says, you know what? We're pouring out the, the wrath of my love, my 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 uh, consuming fire of love on that part of man that still doesn't get it. Right. And uh, and so. Uh, as as we look here, we see that this 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 dominion that emanates from this throne or that goes along with this seat of authority, uh, it's a position or the center from where the authority of a king or a ruler flows out of his to his to his entire kingdom or even to an entire nation. Notice this uh, writer and commentator J. Preston Eby, uh, which is the only commentator I use in this uh, uh, the, these lessons. 
and I use very little. If you look at his commentary, it's massive. And I use just small fragments just to kind of uh, move things along. But here he says, Jesus said uh, uh, of one of the scribes and Pharisees, ye sit in Moses' seat. They administered the law of Moses as the rulers of, Jew, of the Jews. Um, uh, Jesus said to the church at Pergamos, I know your works and where thou dwellest, where uh, even where Satan's seat is. The typical and symbolic church at Pergamos were dwelling uh, where Satan's throne was located. The Greek word here is clearly throne, but the translators of the King James Bible soften it down to seat. Let's, uh, let us not be afraid of the phrase, in the place where the church at Pergamos dwells was Satan's throne. Uh, let us understand the mystery. First, let me give you the location of Pergamos. Uh, the modern city of Izmir um, in Turkey was the ancient Smyrna, uh, is the great city where the tourists go because of the airport and hotels there. It's fascinatingly beautiful city. You go about 65 miles south to reach Ephesus and about 70 miles north to reach Pergamos. These three were in the New Testament times, the royal cities, and they vied with one another. Smyrna or Izmir was the com great commercial center. Ephesus was the great political center and Pergamos was the great re religious center. Now think about that because a lot of things went on in those cities that we would not call uh, Christian, we would not call Christ-like, we would not call uh, anything more than religion. And so uh, the, the reality is that we need to understand uh, that this, this example of the various powers uh, that have sit on his or her seat or throne of authority in this book. And we've seen many of them. Um, you know, but but it all for me, it all points back to the, the, the what what John's revelation is about. And while there is a historical value and we see that things are shifting and changing in people and, and mindsets are being revealed as they're approaching AD 70, there's another parallel that I'd like to uh, tell you, which is that God is working in a people to bring an end to carnal thinking. Amen. Now, I know that uh, sometimes we look at the book of Revelation and we think, what a weird book. We look at the book of Revelation and we think of, of the possibilities of a literal book, even though it's not literal. Now, remember earlier in our studies, we saw in John's vision, as he describes in Revelation 13, verse 1 and 2, and he says, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns, and upon the, the, his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Now we saw that, and you'd have to go back to watch those videos to get a clearer explanation, but the truth is, as we saw that, let's go on to verse two first, and the beast which I saw was likened unto a leopard, and his feet were the feet of a bear, and his mouth the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave his him his power and his seat and his authority. So we see implied authority, delegated authority, but we also know godly authority, which is the dominion we were created with from the very beginning of time. That was uh, not a, a per se, I, I don't know if it was per se a given authority or a delegated authority, but it was a created authority. It was created as a part of us. Amen. And so uh, remember how that the, the book of Revelation is filled with the symbolism and spiritual meanings as John interprets his vision of the heavenly realm, which he saw as it relates to the work God is doing in his children as their minds are being liberated and made completely free to manifest their sonship. I want you to understand God does not liberate us to walk in carnality. God does not liberate us to walk in the, uh, the, the to manifest the, the, the desires of the flesh. God liberates us so that we can manifest our sonship. So as this messenger from the, the, the realm of the spirit pours out his bowl on the throne of the beast, we will look at what it means um, as, as that the kingdom of the beast was now full of darkness. 
Now, let me also say before we move on that as the church of Pergamos was noted as the seed of Satan, we're not saying that Satan is a real uh, deity or a power that is like God. Uh, it, it, and, and let me just say, not even God-like, okay? Not even God-like. Uh, but is a man-made mythological philosophy uh, uh, and, uh, and a man-made ideology. As a matter of fact, Revelation chapter 12 says that the great red fiery dragon and said, uh, called uh, the, the devil and Satan. The word called there means devil and Satan are actually like nicknames from a mythological origin and thus not real. So we need to keep that in mind. Now, in a technical manner of speaking, where did the beast receive its seat of authority? So I'm just giving you some, just some technical uh, positioning about where this authority came from. And uh, the, the fact is, is that as we've read all the way back to chapter 12 about the great red dragon, uh, the, the thing to note is, is that this beastly authority came from the great red dragon, which is defined as, the religious mindset within mankind. So you will read scriptures in the book of Revelation where you see it's almost like the, this great mindset of religion. And I'm going to talk to you about that today. But you see these fingers trickling out or these, these breaking off of different thoughts. It's like the mind has its thoughts as its main belief system. But then you see these, these, these thoughts that, that uh, uh, venture out and these thoughts that uh, produce other things. So, so the reality is, is that uh, it's a mind, a one mind with many patterns of thoughts. And uh, that's kind of how that works. But this great red dragon is a religious mindset within mankind, not in the world, not in, not in, the, the, in space, but within mankind as a whole. The first beast came up out of the earthliness of man's thinking through sin. Now, here again, we look at the word sin, the Greek word hamartia, which refers to error or to be mistaken. And from, from the breakdown of this word, we find uh, the definition of sin to be mistaken identity. And we're going to talk about how mistaken identity has infiltrated mankind today. Uh, even to this day, there are people who operate out of a mistaken identity. You can call it a fallen mindset. You can call it an endemic mindset, a, a, a human nature. You can call it a lot of things. But let's be real. We call sin, sin, because we think what people are doing is sin. Uh, the truth is, is that what people do is the action or the, 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 uh, it's the action or it's the act of, uh, or the portrayal of sin. We call it sinning. We call it sin. But sin itself is the operation of a mistaken identity that it will cause you to carry out the act of what you're mistaken about. So, you know, here again, I want to tell you, and I, this came up this morning and, and uh, before the show, and I want to tell you that, you know, I, 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 I kind of, I heard Dr. Roy Richmond teaching Sunday, and, we, and he talked about people who do various things, such as the act of homosexual, uh, or, or the act of drunkenness, or, or the act of a lot of things that the flesh desires. The scriptures do not portray a man and a man, or a woman and a woman. And I'm not crying out against that. What I'm saying is, is that that's just not the portrayal of God. God created man and woman to love one another another to be the expression of himself and the truth is is that we uh we operate out of a fallen mindset or a mistaken identity no matter what we're doing that is the 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 fulfillment of what the flesh desires but now hear, hear me don't turn me off god loves people unconditionally i don't care what you're doing what you've done or what you're about to do god loves you unconditionally his grace has been uh, uh uh imputed upon you unconditionally god's not holding sins and trespasses against you now that means this then let's say for example because this is important to this this changing of the beastly nature or beastly mindset or even a carnal mindset to that of uh, walking as a fully manifested son and daughter of God. Let's say that that I, uh, Dr. Bill, operates under this mistaken identity, and uh, I literally 
I literally uh, go out and uh, 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 rob uh, 7-Elevens or convenience stores every now and then just to finance my ministry. Now that's not only not, that's not only robbing, rob, uh, uh, operating out of a fear of, of where is God? Can't God take care of me? But that's also breaking the law. Uh, so there's a lot of things that have been defined in our country, the United States of America as laws. And there's been the breaking of those laws. But here's the thing about it, folks. God loves you unconditionally. You can go to prison for murder. You can go to prison and be uh, put on death row. And you can actually be um, uh, executed. And God still loves you unconditionally. Do you know where you're going to go after that? You're going to be right where in the realm you've been connected with the whole time in the realm of that great cloud of witnesses, uh, that, uh, uh, that, uh, that realm of, of the God's messengers, uh, just because we operate in a natural awareness right now. So for me to steal and to, to rob and to, to hold up convenience stores would be operating out of a mistaken identity. So I'm trying to use a lightweight example to bring a real picture to the forefront that we have operated out of some things that was never God's best for us. Okay. Now, uh, so the, the first beast gave its, uh, gave its authority to the second beast. So we have this religious mindset in mankind as a whole. Now, mankind individually does a lot of things, okay? We do a lot of stuff. But the truth is, is that we, uh, as, we, as we do all of those things, it all comes from the oneness of our religious mindset. And so the first beast got its authority from the religious mindset and it gave authority to the second beast so that the authority of the second beast is also the authority of the throne of the dragon or the seed of the dragon. So the second beast out of the earth realm or out of the solical religious powers of men symbolizes the renegade church systems of men. Now hear me today which have not uh, uh, not understood the teachings and purposes of why Christ came and have for centuries held this religious system, often known as, we're going to call it Christendom today, uh, and, and have exercised its assumed authority over people, over nations, over kings, uh, and things in the earth realm. And I talk about assumed authority because honestly, we in Christendom have had some assumed authority uh, or exercised authority in places that we really never had authority. But we need to understand there's a difference between authority uh, um, uh, that we actually have versus what has been assumed. Now, let me just go on to say this and welcome everybody, all you who are just now joining the show. God bless you. Thank you so much. Um, so we we see through this uh, this idolatrous these idolatrous patterns in its doctrines from where um, uh, corrupted errors or corrupted rituals or corrupted sacraments produce a what we call a powerless church. Let's face it, there's the church that's walked in power. And I don't mean power because you can get out and perform miracles. I mean power just so you can walk in encouragement and victory every day. God didn't call you to discouragement. God didn't call you to depression. God called you to victory, right? And you don't walk in that victory just because of Christ, even though Christ came to show you through his sacrifice and get your attention. He came to show you what the Father was like. But you walk in overcoming power because that's how you were created from before the foundation of the world. So Christendom has been powerless because of a carnal mindset causing her spiritual life to be without revelation and appears as a stagnated and dead system. Just think with me for a moment why so many people over the years have become tired of going to church, tired of hearing preaching. They turn off Christian television on their, on their TVs, even though I don't, necessarily watch Christian television. I watch more on the on YouTube or on the internet. Uh, but think about what, why there's been such a turnoff to uh, people around the world when it comes to Christianity or what we're calling today Christendom. Well, there's been a great deal of turnoff, right? Um, I mean, 
because we've seen a religious system that just doesn't work. Okay, so the fact is this, that the entire religious system of the ancient great red dragon concept was birthed out of mythology, causing billions of so-called Christians to believe that they had to bow down to this religious system of do's and don'ts just to please God. Now, let's face it, you've probably been there just like I have. I was raised in that. And so you've probably been there where you thought, if I don't do, then I'm in trouble. If I do, then I'm okay. Well, the fact is, is you're not okay or you're not in trouble based on your performance. You're okay because God made you out of himself. Now, again, the seat of the beast called in modern scripture as Satan's throne, which we're talking about here for a moment or two, uh, Satan's throne started its religion when the first hiss took place within the mind of Eve and she forgot who she was created as. Now think about this, Eve in and of herself was not a bad person. Adam was birthed out of the spirit realm just like you. So they're not bad people and, and let, there's different beliefs about Adam and Eve that they're really symbolic of like Eve is symbolic of the of, of God or of the, the, the church or the heart of God. And Eve is kind of symbolic of Israel or I mean Adam symbolic of Israel. I don't know whether those things are accurate or not, but let's just let's just go with that Adam and Eve were literal people. Well, Adam and Eve uh, did not intend to interact with a serpent. Now, the serpent was not a physical snake. The serpent was a mindset, something going on in Eve. And I think what it was is that, that Eve began to have thoughts. God said, here's a tree that you shouldn't eat of. And um, uh, Eve began to question that and thoughts begin to form. Uh, and and she, the, 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 the snake represents a hiss. And so there was a hissing in the mind of Eve that caused her to, to forget who she was. Genesis 3 verse 1 in the New King James says, God indeed said, you should not eat of every tree of the garden. So Eve began to question within her own mind the choice given to them. So here's the trees of the garden that you can eat of, eat all of that you want, but here's the one, stay away from. And even if that's symbolic, okay, even if it represents something else, let's just go with that for the moment and just say that it was actual and real or literal and real. So if that's so, then let's think about it this way. Uh, Genesis 2, 15 through 17 says, and the Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend or to cultivate and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat. Keep in mind, Eve is not being birthed out of Adam's uh, side, out of the rib yet. Verse 17, but the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat for in the day that you shall eat of it, you will surely die. Now, some people believe that's where death began. And let me just say, there's a literal translation here that says this, that uh, it says that uh, to, to surely die is literally translated as dying you shall die, meaning to die prematurely. Dying you shall die. So you don't die and then you die again. Uh, you, you, it, it's, it's talking about premature death. It's talking about that death was never God's intention. Why do you think Jesus came and he abolished death? He didn't abolish death in terms of that God already had not designed us for death, uh, but he did in terms of that uh, uh, to shake our memory, to get our attention, to let us know that, hey, you are created for this, so we're, we're dealing with this again. Uh, so th this means that the lie of separation from God will cause them to die prematurely, even though Adam lived to be 930 years old. Now, history records only one other person that outlived Adam, which was um, Methuselah. And, and it really doesn't matter the symbolisms or the, the realities or the literalists or anything. The point is, is that Adam lived to be uh, 930 years old. But the moment that Eve heard the hissing voice in her mind, she pondered what God had said about not eating the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, here's the thing. The knowledge held a lie. 
uh, the, the lie of a carnal mindset of the struggle of self-effort and self-dependence as in a sense of separation from God. What do you think independence is? To be independent of something is to be separated from something, right? And so this, this mindset of independence um, uh, be, be, became the uh, to the forefront of Eve's thinking. And questions begin to arise in her thoughts, which said something like, should I do good or what if I do bad? And afterward, how will God feel about me? Now, now don't tell me today that you've not had these thoughts at some point in your life, just like I have or anybody else has. Should I do good? And if I do good, you know, will I be approved of God? And if I do bad, how's God going to feel about me after that? Is God still going to love me? Am I still going to be accepted by God? You know, the truth about Adam and Eve was that they were already like God and did not need to add anything to the equation. Are you hearing that? So this is why I have to go back, even though I'm teaching the last book in the Bible, which I believe should be the first book in the Bible. Uh, that's why I'm teaching the last book in the Bible, because the, the truth is, is that 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 Genesis 1, 1 before and after is the beginning, is the culmination of this whole thing. And the equation presented here is not really a, an equation, but a statement of truth. And that is that you were created, you were formed, you were squeezed out of God's own person, his own being, and you were created his mirrored reflection. And for me to look in the mirror and see a reflection would be me, a reflection of me, but not my true self. It would just be a a reflection but when God created you as his reflection the word reflection there's much deeper than uh, just looking in a mirror it's almost like a carbon copy of the exact same because see even though we're one with God we're one with God the Godhead is one we are one with all mankind whether we like it or not but we're also one with our Creator and just as God is one and we are one with him it does not take away our individualness to be the reflection of God to express ourselves to be the express image of who God is in this world and so when it comes to Adam and Eve they fell into mistaken identity and they were still like God uh, in that they were created from God and as God so what they experienced was a mindset of separation from God even though they were not really separated from him you, you understand that you can be totally fine but believe you're not and you begin to operate out of that mistaken identity. And so they were not separated from God, but they, they experienced the mindset or the thoughts of separation. Now, within the, uh, uh, within the emotions of mankind, this is the place where many people operate from uh, in their mind, which I have called uh, separation anxiety. Now, separation anxiety is a, a valid uh, emotional uh, and, and traumatic experience for a lot of human beings today. But the fact is, is that Adam and Eve began to, let's say panic, okay? Uh, he did it. No, she did it. No, it was the other person's fault. No, I heard this voice. And the blame game began to arise because of the fear of separation. I'm not really separated, but I think I'm separated, so I op operate out of the fear of separation. And this is where many people deal with emotional instabilities, even in their faith. Right? Okay. So this is why I say that the religion of Christendom is a false form based on a carnal man-made effort of knowing God, even though this could be called a so-called Christian religion. I'm not against people calling themselves Christians. I'm not against the idea of Christianity. I, I think it's awesome. I think it's wonderful that we are Christians per se. What I don't want to do is use my Christianness to say I'm a Christian and you're not because I don't want to separate anybody from me even in their minds just like God didn't want anybody being separated from him even in their minds so we see you see here what we do and what we are is called God and his family 
Uh, that I've heard that years ago. That's the best expression I've ever heard about this thing called Christianity is we're talking about God and his family. Uh, what we do and, and what we are is knowing our true identity from our origin out of God. And we've got to grab hold of that and, and get that in our thinking and, and hang on to that. At Genesis 3, verse 5 in the New King James said, For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing or to be enlightened to good and evil. You see, Adam and Eve began to die uh, physically. They were immortal, but they began to die because they believed they were separated from God. Listen, listen, there is there. I knew somebody who said they wanted to die in life. I knew somebody that prophesied their own death. They spoke death. They spoke their desire of death. And, and, uh, and, 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 you know, I, I don't understand all of the reasons why a person would prophesy their own death, but this person died. Uh, this person got, uh, got, got through this negative separation mindset, through this fear, uh, it got cancer throughout all of their body and died and was just fine with dying. I want to tell you something, that God didn't create you for death. God created you for life. God didn't create you for the struggle of the, doing good or doing evil or where do I, do I teeter totter between the two? No, God created you to eat of the tree of life. Uh, the, the tree and, and Jesus is the tree of life. Father God is the tree of life. This whole thing of being created as immortal spirit beings, just like our father is eating of the tree of life. Embracing that is the eating of it. And so they begin to believe they were separated from God, which simply means that they believe that where they were not like God or even as God. This is a great struggle today in Christendom is believing that we're not God. Uh, and, and I say that because even David said in Psalms chapter eight, he said, what is man that you are mindful of him? Uh, you visited him. You crowned him with glory and honor. You created him a little lower than the angels in our modern translations. But in our, 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 our Hebrew translations, it doesn't read that way. And someone said to me one time, you know, just quote the King James and take it, quote the whole verse and, and don't put in any Greek or Hebrew. Look, I can't take a modern translation of our day and time and say that's the voice of God. I have to go back and I have to try to unscramble what God really said in an, ori in an uh, original language. And what I read there is God didn't say you're a little lower than angels or even a little lower than Elohim. But he said, you are as gods. And that God there is a lowercase g, but he's saying you are as gods. And so when we say we are as God, uh, the, the people really freak out about that and saying you're trying to take God's place. No, that's not it. Because see, God created everyone like himself in that we are his reflection. And what religion teaches today is carnal realm theology. We're not like God. But Adam and Eve begin to, to change in their, their body, in their chemistry. They begin to die because they believed they were separated from God. And that mindset, that thought came out of, of, of the fact that they believed they were not like God. To be separated from God is to believe that you're not like God. And that's what religion teaches. Religion teaches to live by the senses and nothing more. To live by what you can touch, but live by what you can see, what you can hear, and nothing more. But what the world has known as religion is defined as as the the belief and uh, belief in and worship of a superhuman controlling power, especially a personal uh, a personal god or gods. Now. While in that worldly definition, and I say worldly, uh, I got that I think from Marion Webster, and, and, and Webster was a, a preacher, uh, and thank God for him. But here's the thing about it: uh, when we when we think about a personal uh, worship of a superhuman controlling power, uh, that's not what God wants. God wasn't trying to control Adam and Eve. God was drawing their attention by saying, "Look, I made you exactly like me. What more can you want?" Because remember what the voice said, that if God knows that in the day you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will be as God. No, already were. Okay. So the religious realm 
uh, of which many have pledged their lives to is through the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which sounds like a deeper revelation of God, but in reality, it has no life. Now, now hear this, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is simply knowledge of the letter of the word, or we, we've said in scripture, the letter of the law, uh, of the commandments of men, or of the traditions of our spiritual leaders, so to speak, who substitute the truth of God for a simple carnal understanding of the Christian life. For me, I don't want a simple carnal understanding of the Christian life. I want the revelation of who God is. I want the revelation of how God made me to be like himself so that I can operate in this world and say the words as he is, so am I in this world. To believe the words as he is, so am I in this world and live my life based on that principle that I am just like God. Because again, I want to remind you, that was the separation mindset of Ab that, that infiltrated Adam and Eve. They believed they were not like God. Now, that, that's, that's what Jesus came to do. He's the way, the truth, and the tree of life. I know it's the way, the way, the truth, and life, but he's the way, the tree, and the truth, and the tree of life. And that, that knowledge of the life of God has always been in you, maybe laying dormant, waiting to arise to the forefront of your awareness in some ways. And that would be so that you would stop living in religion and start living as you were created to be. Amen. That is the heart of God. Amen. Amen. And so I hope you can see that today because this is so, so important. Amen. Now, let's notice this, that the fifth messenger that we're talking about um, poured his bowl on the throne of the beastly nature within the soul. This is my kind of transliteration of this. He, he, he poured the bowl, the contents of the bowl uh, on the on the, the throne of the beastly nature within the soul of mankind so that our awareness might be awakened to who we have always been. In Revelation uh, 1 verse, uh, I'm sorry, in Revelation 16 and uh, verse number uh, 10, it says here, and, the, and, and his kingdom became full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. Now, now think about that today because uh, that sounds like a gory, horrible situation, right? Um, but notice this, the word darkness always represents the absence of light, right? I mean, that's a, uh, yeah, duh, you know, like uh, that's, that's, that's not uh, a big deal at all. Well, it does. And this fifth plague, uh, the stroke of uh, or wound coming directly from out of the throne of God, which is within you, reveals to all the inhabitants uh, or carnal thoughts in you that could have been symbolized as a type of spiritual Pergamos or spiritual uh, Egypt or spiritual Babylon and the beastly kingdoms there that have no true light in them. So it doesn't matter whether you worship this way or worship that way, and that becomes your spiritual kingdom of, of your beastly system, your belief system. And you might say, this is the true way to God. Uh, the reality is, is the true way to God is God. OK, uh, let me just say it this way. The true way to God is that which is being unveiled within you. Amen. And so the reality is, is that and I know I'm saying in the, rea the reality is because I think it's such a such an important thing to uh, hear today. The, the, the only, they only have their carnal doctrines and carnal interpretations of truth as well as their man-made observances. Now, remember. Uh, that the purpose was that these la these seven last plagues were symbolically sent to remove every religious thing that reminds uh, that remains in us, keeping us tied to an earthly awareness that keeps us thinking that we are separated from God. That's why these bowls symbolically, okay, again, John's having a vision and Revelation 1 bears out that, that he sit and signified it, signified meaning symbolic, uh, which had there are clues that proves and bears out this symbolic language. And, um, 
And so God sent this to, uh, as John saw in this vision of all this symbolic and spiritual truth, so that uh, our awareness would not keep us thinking that we were separated from God. Writer and commentator J. Preston Eby says, it is my deep conviction that through the, uh, the ministry of God's called and qualified elect, there will be shed forth such a mighty revelation of truth uh, and reality until the power of, of that the doctrines of men and traditions of the elders hold held over people, the people will be uh, drawn off, uh, plunging the whole system into thick darkness. The bestial kingdom is worldwide and the darkness brought in this bowl uh, the darkness brought in by this bowl of God's passion is coextensive to his empire. From the throne to be utmost, from the throne to the utmost limits of, of religious Babylon, everything is shrouded in the mantle of deep, dark, uh, st starless night. Isaiah prophesied this when he said, Behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. Uh, Job prophesied of it uh, when he said, The day uh, of the Lord cometh and a, a, a day of darkness, of gloominess, the day of clouds and thick darkness. Uh, the sun shall be turned into darkness. Uh, in this great day of the Lord, a dreadful pall of uh, of, of um of doom is destined to settle over the higher kingdom of the beast, which has been built upon uh, his throne and the, in the heights of the man's carnal mind. Now listen to this. The kingdom includes all the earth dwellers, the carnal minded, solical centered Christians, followers and worshipers of the bestial religious orders. So, you know, there is what is called man-made religion. A man-made religion, for me, at least I think what, what I believe man-made religion is, is when we take the basics of a misunderstood Bible, misunderstood scriptures, and we begin to form our assumptions of what we think it means without ever doing research, because there is an old-time belief that says we don't use uh, the Strong's Concordance, or we, which was uh, made in 1890, I think. Uh, we don't use Greek and Hebrew. We don't read other translations. We stick to one translation only, generally the King James Version. And then we formulate all of these things that we think Christianity is. That becomes a man-made religion. And so this is a great prophetic word that Dr. Uh, J. Preston Eby gave. Uh, uh, as as long as you understand that it is not speaking about the destruction of all who do not believe in Jesus at this present time. No, the destruction only is that God has uh, ever ever wanted was the destruction of every thought that truly does not project His true heart for His creation. Amen. Now, uh, the effect of the outpouring of this fifth bowl of God's dealings was intended to produce such torment while living in carnality, that carnality no longer looked good. That operating in darkness, that darkness no longer looked good. And it seems that an effort, uh, an effective description of this phrase uh, could be rendered this way. They gnawed their tongues because of the pain. Now, I know we see that in actual scripture, but that's a real good expression, Like, uh, and I'll explain that in a few moments. Um, <clears throat> uh, sometimes the emotional pain of being in a place of dark, uh, of darkened in your, uh, uh, darkened or darkness in your mind, uh, of having little to no understanding of the Father in you, can seem to feel like you are in torment as in the gnawing their tongue, which could symbolically uh, represent uh, the chewing over and over the idea of fear of being separated from God in any way. Think about this. Again, Adam and Eve came to that place of uh, we think we're separated from God. We think God doesn't love us. Now God's coming back for another visitation today, and we're going to go and hide among the trees of the garden. Why did they have to hide? Well, they thought they were naked, so they needed to be clothed. They hid themselves from God. Look, 
The truth is they begin to develop this separation mindset. And so when we see this, it creates a state of fear, a state of panic, a state of the chewing over and over, the gnawing of the tongue, not literally chewing your tongue, but uh, in a symbolic way. Uh, Revelation 16 verse 11 said, they blaspheme the God of heaven uh, because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. Now, when we think about repent today, we think of the at least one of the two Greek words, uh, metanoia or metanoio, which means to change the way you think or to change uh, your mind afterwards. Uh, so the truth is, when we see that, we think about that uh, in ancient, and we think about change your mind. So I say repentance or repent, and people think change the way you think. And that's so accurately translated. But in ancient Egypt, it seems that the physical act of repentance was not very clear in their language, that is. So while uh, the Egyptians did not seem to have an actual word for repentance, I'm talking about the Egyptian language, uh, which has some similarities uh, to accurately spoken Hebrew language. Uh, when we When we think about that, what, what we see is they literally considered it to be a swallowing of the heart, not a chewing of the tongue uh, or a gnashing of the tongue, but swallowing of the heart, which is what they uh, what we would call a change of heart or a change of mind, which of course is our Greek definition for repentance. So while they didn't have a word for it, they still had something symbolic that would say, you know what, we need to swallow our heart, uh, which Revelation defines as the gnawing of the tongue. We need to swallow our heart or change the way we think. So there is no repentance required of us concerning the unveiling of Christ Jesus. What I mean is you can't you can't explain away or apologize for the revelation of truth in the book of Revelation. When we talk about the revelation of Christ in you, the hope of glory, that's what we're dealing with. I view the book of Revelation maybe differently, maybe a little bit differently than other people. I see it as the processing of people's minds uh, that they will come from carnality to sonship, okay? Uh, from the cross to AD 70, but still from carnality to to sonship. So there is no repentance about that revelation. No need to change your mind except to believe or to buy into this revelation because the manifestation of his life within us invokes repentance in our soul, uh, but the spirit of sonship needs no repentance. Now, now hear what I said. Uh, when you think differently than this revelation of Christ, then there needs to be the act of repentance. But when it comes to the spirit of sonship that is already in you, that's rising forth, there needs to be no repentance there. It's the soul that repents. It's the soul that changes the way it thinks. So in other words, the only repentance in the book of Revelation on the part of the church is when it comes to its immaturity, its imperfection, its carnality as revealed in chapters two and chapters three. Now, just a real short little quote here. J. Preston Neby says, this repentance is shown on the part of God's first fruits company who are brought to perfection. Keep that in mind, brought to perfection and the full stature of Christ under the sounding of the seven trumpets. And later on, uh, the part of the rest of the Lord's people who are purged, purified and perfected through the pouring out of the seven bowls. Again, this is a symbolic language of something that happened not literally to a people in the first century, but a revelation that John got as he saw this vision and he began to try to put it into words and interpret it. And then in our modern Bibles has gotten so misinterpreted. So it's true that every son of God must have a heart to repent when a change of mind is needed. So it's not, oh, God, forgive me. I've messed up so bad. It's not that. It's just like, you know, wow, I see that truth. And so now I'm embracing that truth instead of fighting against that truth, right? Okay. So uh, the Adamic mindset must die in us. The Adamic mindset must come to an end. You are not like Adam. You are not from Adam. You don't have the same nature. You don't have the same qualities. Uh, you don't have the same 
mind of Adam. You have the mind of Christ, the, actually the mind that was in Christ. Amen? All right. Amen. Metanoia. Uh, change, uh, change of mind. You've got to have a change of mind. Now, uh, the, Adamic, uh, the Adamic mindset must die in us, and John saw it come to an end, which means that we can walk in the full knowledge of Christ's consciousness as God, right? Amen. The Adamic mindset of man is flesh and blood, yet it was created out of spirit. Let me say that again. The Adamic mindset is flesh and blood, yet was created out of spirit. So in other words, they were first spirit, okay? They didn't have this mistaken identity, this fallen mindset, but uh, because their spirit, see, the soul has many times blasphemed the God of heaven due to a lack of illumination, uh, said things against God. R really, that's the, that's the short of blasphemy. They said things that were the opposite that God said. Remember when the Bible said that, that, that uh, uh, the, the word of God is, is like a two-edged sword of Hebrews 4, verse 12, I think, something like that. The word of God is like a two-edged sword. That actually is translated in the Greek language, a two-mouthed sword, meaning God says it, and then you in response say the same thing. It's two mouths saying the same thing. So it's two mouths as one. Amen. Uh, so uh, we repent or change the way we think so that the God light of truth may manifest in our soulish mind. I hope this has helped somebody today because as a new covenant remnant that uh, is uh, that came out that has come out of Christ uh, and continues to emerge and be unveiled to this generation, we're going to have to bring healing and order to the chaos in those that are around us. And here's the thing, folks, we are emerging in a new mindset. We're dropping that old carnal thinking of religious mindsets, and we're emerging into the same mind as sons and daughters of God. Amen. And so the truth is this, that God has a new level of thinking for you and me, which is to start thinking like kings who operate out of a supernatural realm. 24 7 so stick with me on this journey as we continue to see more of the unveiling the revelation of the unveiling of christ in you the hope of glory so that we can discover what john found out as he stepped into the heavenly realms of god which changed him forever that which is there is already in you but that which is there uh, as it arises will change everything about you uh, we operate out of the heavenly christ he is the heavenly christ he is the, the, the God of the heavens, and he lives in us. It's time to embrace heaven's mindset right now in this life so that we can experience heaven on earth. Amen. God wants heaven, the knowledge of God, to flood your earth, which is the physical or the, the essence of, of U.S. spirit, soul, and body. God wants his essence to flood you. Amen. I hope you got something out of this today. And uh, if you would, we don't have television ratings, but if you would just go ahead and click like and then share uh, so that others around the world can watch this message. Uh, this was powerful today. I hope it was a real blessing to you. And I will see you tomorrow night. Apostle John Barrett will be on Kingdom Dynamics, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. Friday morning, Pastor Lynn uh, Garner uh, and I will be starting a series at 10 a.m. on Friday mornings. Central Standard Time, uh, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Amen. So thank you for joining me, and I will see you next time. Have a great day, everybody. Praise the Lord. Amen. Bye-bye.